Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Oh. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Justin, Diane, Rick, Ravi, Lucian. So happy you're all here with us today. I'm really excited about uh, sharing uh, the work of Matt Cummings, a poet uh, in Rockford, uh, Illinois. Today, Matt's sharing his work asynchronously uh, because uh, this is uh, due to his availability, but he is, has generously uh, given us permission to uh, cast his, uh, his poetry, and uh, I cannot wait to, for you to uh, see what he, has, uh, he and I have shared with you. Matt Cummings is a disabled poet. He lives with deafness as well. He's a deaf poet and also lives with a uh, uh, with a cerebral palsy. So today I've invited Diane Murray Ward to be our uh, response artist for next week. So after uh, during this week, uh, Diane will come up with a prompt related to what uh, Matt has created. And uh, Diane will be our science artist next week. All right, welcome again. And without further ado, I will uh, share screen and share Matt's work. After uh, the, the three pieces that I have uh, put together for you, we are going to have a discussion about uh, what your impressions of Matt's work is. And then after that, I will be inviting you all to share your responses. So welcome. Hello, Diane. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be my Sayang artist uh, for next week. And I'm so happy that you're here. Hello, Ian. Welcome. Hi. All right. That uh, piece was performed by Justin Slusher. A uh, uh, poem was written by Matt Cummings. Next poem.
That poem was written and performed by Mac Cummings. That was Ballerina. And finally, And that, everyone, is the set that we have curated for you. Thank you, Matt, for the pieces that uh, you have shared with us. So I'm going to invite Diane Murray Ward to share her thoughts and impressions uh, as our Cyan artist for next week. Diane, one of the reasons why I uh, picked you to be the paired response artist this uh, and my Sayang artist this um, cycle is because you have experience uh, doing ekphrastic work and also because you are uh, a movement artist. So I, at this time, I would love to hear your thoughts about uh, the work that Matt and I have curated. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good day. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, it, uh, every time I see American Sign Language performed along with movement, I mean, people need to understand that as a modern jazz dancer, I also incorporated ASL in my work in some of my performance pieces. So it was really nice to see that this multilingualism is also shared to the uh, culture of deafness. And so a lot of times it's excluded, which is unfortunate. The language, it's a culture, it's a way of life. Um, and everybody feels the same, thinks the same, enjoys the same, loves the same, has heart of the same. Okay, it's just a different way of communicating. ASL is beautiful, it's graceful, it's wonderful, it's expressive. Um, if any of you have studied ASL, you know, it's just not, it's not just hands. You use every part of your face, okay? your eyebrows, your eyes, everything is expressive that adds to the communication. So I'm really happy that these three pieces that you picked, Kissing the Skeleton, On Point, and ASL, um, Batman, <laughs> of course, okay? I mean, you've shown a, a wide range which is what we all have in terms of interest and experience. And I just think this brings a lot of uh, individuals closer together to that humanity. So I really enjoyed, I enjoyed this piece very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for, uh, for giving your first impressions of uh, Matt's work. Matt gave us a theme for uh, the cycle as well. And it's called, uh, he I asked him, I said, do you want to do trap poetry, which is the, the um, site that he uh, writes, uh, he has named a site. And he has also written under the moniker trap poet. But in our recent conversations, Matt, is say uh, has chosen to depart a little bit more uh, from his uh, previous moniker and going by his name now. And 
I asked him, I said, Matt, what has made the change? And as a person living with disability myself, we had a great discussion about uh, what does it, you know, does our disability define uh, the way we create? Or is it just a descriptor of uh, our lives and a, a part of the content of what we create? And so uh, the, these are the conversations that we are having about uh, uh, our art uh, in poetry as well as in our other art forms. So. At this time, I'd like to invite other people. Uh, do, do you have any uh, first impressions about uh, Matt's work? Ravi. Yeah, what uh, struck me uh, was the kind of shift that is, semantic shift that has taken place in expressing uh, the discoids that one feels in one's own time. I'm thinking of um, Cervantes to begin with, the way um, uh, the need for a hero in one's own uh, lifetime results in the kind of clowning that um, uh, Cervantes' uh, uh, hero, uh, Don Quixote, represents uh, the hero as clown the hero as fallible, the hero as a failure, the hero as, um, as somebody with a persecution complex. Um, make a quick jump to the presentation today. Uh, the modern man has become so chaotic. He has no option but to look at comic book heroes for some alleviation. Not real heroes. Real heroes are not there. And therefore, you can't even uh, make real heroes clowns. So you need to go to the clowns, or rather, uh, virtual clowns, to look for your heroes. This is, for me, um, a terrible situation. A situation which shows the kind of devolution that has taken place, a semantic devolution that has taken place in uh, the creative sphere. Thank you. I think it's, uh, thank you Ravi for, for, for that perspective. It didn't even uh, uh, occur to me that we're still looking for um, people in our lives to represent uh, models, villains and heroes, clowns. And yet, hopefully through our search in uh, our art and in our community, we can find threads that we can uh, connect with people and maybe we can uh, find those archetypes again in the future. Lucian? No, I was going to highlight Rick is raise his hand. OK. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought that the the arc of the narratives from this uh, elusive superhero, uh, the dark hero, uh, which seemed to me to speak to the unattainable power that we, we all would like to have uh, from, our, from our little selves to a grander stage. And then moving through this to the, to the, to the mirror element, where it suggested to me, again, just from the elements selected, um, now we're looking again at the truer self, and uh, I think I thought found it very interesting, especially in the context that he's moving from a uh, a, a name, you know, a stage name to his real name. Uh, that seemed to me to be speaking to that same reckoning. I'm not thinking superheroes. I'm thinking about what I can do. What what am I in this mirror, and what does the mirror show me? 
uh, I thought it was a, a beautiful evolution from this unattainable power that, that's out there, mythic, to what what is in my grasp? What what is it that am I? And again, like I said, especially in the context that now he's using his own name, that that that's a butterfly to me. That's a out of the cocoon and wings are spreading. You know. Thank you, Rick. I think uh, what you shared truly uh, captures uh, some of the conversations that Matt and I have been having about uh, uh, who we are and uh, what does our work represent and uh, what do we hide behind or what do we want to get out from behind that emergence. I think for me, what was also very poignant was dialing into the lack of auditory input. The first piece, I felt a lot of tension purely because of that. I'm not, I wasn't used to just watching something silent, which is why I sent a note to, to you. Hey, was that supposed yeah, to be? Yeah, you kept with? asking, got sound or not? I'm like, oh, I didn't even thought, think about that. And, and it took that first piece for me to shift into a place of empathy and immersion. And then I could see from the second piece on the world through his eyes, through the hearing impaired eyes. So much so that by the third piece, when there was audio, it was actually quite jarring. So I thought that was fascinating. It, it illuminated my dependence on auditory input to gather information, to sort things out, to anticipate something, a punchline. But to see it again, how it was built through visual cues was actually quite fascinating. Yeah, I I, I only caught at the end that I was a little bit not unsure, what, a bit unsure what the theme was, or what it was about, but as it went on, I, I suddenly got the, this impression that you're hearing impaired. To me, it seemed like the role was being reversed, that I was seeing or experiencing uh, an event or experience, maybe in the way that hearing impaired are experiencing life all the time in what is a normal hearing world. And at first, I I, I found it quite disorienting at first because oh, I've got you now I, I was kind of looking at the screen, so I'm going to be I I need to look at the the. the the print that's coming up on screen because I I didn't I didn't understand what the, you know like the hand signals you know the, the uh, thing so it was like putting me in a in a position sort of to reciprocate how it must be like for sort of hearing impaired people all of the time you know and and just just for a few minutes uh, I was feeling quite out of my depth and so. Um, Kind of like brought it home to me in a way well if, you, if you're experiencing that 24 7 how uncomfortable or isolating that must be for somebody with that condition justin um i noticed that ian um used his hands a lot more and like um to 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 indicate the the expressiveness of the the thing and i thought that the theme of trap was very um apt because like um without a voice it's like being trapped in your own body unable to express the the feelings and emotions that go through you that cause through you and it's like the the zen koan of like um if a tree falls in the forest and no one no one is there to hear it doesn't really fall or a silent scream like in in, in outer space like deep space nine uh, when when someone screams there do like is there a scream does anyone hear you scream when you're screaming in space mm -hmm. so i thought it was a very um opportune yeah. moment to move the hands yeah i i i think anyone who knows me well knows that i <laughs> i wave my hands about a lot there, 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 are, there are times when i wish i could sort of be talking have a pair of handcuffs or something to tie my hands down to stop it waving about it's kind of like a 
inbuilt reflex. I don't know, I'm doing it again. I, you know, it's kind of all the time. I've got to be careful, yeah. You know, it gets a little bit out of hand. Oops, so there it goes. That was a terrible unintended pun there uh, at times. Thanks. Thanks, Justin, yeah, for pointing that out to me. Cool. So, um, Matt, I hope you enjoyed the initial uh, comments and impressions that uh, your, uh, the curated poems have um, evoked. And at this time, I would like to uh, offer us a little bit of silence. So instead, of, uh, Lucian, did you uh, uh, curate for us some music? I actually because, did not, but let me... No, 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 no. actually, I, I was hoping you did not, because it would be very appropriate for us to sit in silence and let our minds and thoughts help us write and prepare our, resp uh, our written and our shared responses. So for the next five minutes, uh, we are going to uh, just uh, enjoy silence with one another. If you feel comfortable, uh, prefer to uh, turn off your uh, screen and video to uh, wrap your thoughts, you're welcome to do as uh, well this time, similarly to being in a workshop setting. Now, who would like to respond with their work? Ravi. Uh -huh. This is what um, I put down just now after having watched the uh, videos. I've titled it Of Silence. There is no event in this world of silences and mere gestures. What are deeds and what are histories? When each pass the other with either a stare or a gesture, will the seismic movement of population stop enduring all humanity? Silence is not so much boredom. Silence is not so much absence. Nor is it an unwillingness. Silence is, will be, and the end. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Who would like to respond next? Rick. I don't have a piece on silence, but I do have a piece on space. And I think when we contemplate the cosmos, it's so much bigger than anything we can uh, put up against our mortality. So I offer you this. It's called Deep in Space. Deep in space and back in time, it seems somehow almost to rhyme. We've got a new look deeper yet. It's almost as if we somehow forget how much is out there, the cosmic comic book. And we stare at our feet, almost stuck in the soil or mired in the muck, as if that's all that was there, the extent of our luck. Yet sometimes as we scan the vast open sky, it can definitely startle and open our eyes that we might to a higher shelf aspire instead of dropping in the flopping mire. The first deep field shot of S Max 0723, known to most as the starry stuff we see, a near infrared view like a speck of sand at arm's length viewed. Weave with our clumsy techno artifacts fresh wisdom, vision renewed. And we check these tracks as millions of galaxies spinning so far off. Webb's NERCAM scanning across the broad frequencies gather up this philosophical feast, this artist's cup. We glimpse 4.6 billion years ago an evening's entertainment, the sweet lover's afterglow. The galactic cluster makes a gravitational lens, so we might wave at our ancient distance friends. 
Thank you, James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you, Rick. Justin. Hello, everyone. I thought it was particularly apt to um to use a book that has been banned because the animals were talking in a book when like um some some people thought that um animals shouldn't talk only humans should talk so this Charles Web was a banned book because um the animals were talking in it <laughs> okay our tale of silent entrapment enactment begins from a non-verbal fragment enchantment of squeaky beach animal of porcine procession about to be slaughtered on festive occasion. Wilbur was a rambunctious runt of the litter. Was it so surprising he would make a lit friend Hitler? Some pig moved from noisy fair to quiet pigsty and thought French Charlotte was bloodthirsty. Enter illegal grey arachnoric spiry, whose candy weighs more than a fly. Indeed, has a faucet buzzing bother over at her octagonal palace for dinner. Charlotte was the warm friend, though cold blooded, wove her web in the corner there suspended. Never asked for anything, gave it her all. The self sacrificing friendship makes one want to ball. The minuscule insect and the livestock, swift interceptor of flies and sloppy hawk. This friendship not only unusual, it doesn't shine like a jewel. Who's to say what nature ordained? The spider's web chats flyers better than the beach whales at tight app. Or the humans thought that pig was a celeb, where wise and kind one was the littlest chalet. Some pig, terrific, radiant, humble. Persuaded farmer not to pork chop amid scrambles, to let so 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 terror stricken live with a what special ribbon. In Wilbur's mouth, Charlotte's legacy, and eggs bag. 540 little spiderlings to be born without mother's neck. The little pig did nothing for grey spider passing, and she did not lament her land of life, singing, How very special are we, for just a moment to be, part of life's eternal rise. Thank you. Thank you for also singing to us, Justin. Um, I was thinking also about uh, how we think so many things, factors divide us and separate us and how friendships can be found from different, even if we're different, we can still forge those friendships. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> those pig ears. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Molly. Good to see you. Who would like to go next? Diane? Diane, then Ian. Okay. I, I was trying to tell Molly I couldn't hear her. I think she was speaking, but I couldn't hear her. And uh, I just want to say, Justin, it may not be so unusual that they talk to each other and, and interspecies talk to each other. It's just that it's not on the frequency for us. It's none of our business. So they probably talk about us all the time. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Maybe they don't want to talk to us. Hello, you know, do you blame well, them? Or or Orwell, Orwell <laughs> believed that the pigs could talk to each other. Yeah, I believe it. I think chickens, dogs talk to each other, cats talk to each other. I really do. Anyway, um, because I was not familiar with Matt, I looked him up on, and there was a YouTube piece that uh, shows him um, drag racing. And so now with what you've shown today, it gives me a much fuller picture of who Matt Cummings is. So I'm going back to 
to who you presented today, and, and I have added a piece to what I previously wrote. So I watched you form the alphabet. I neither needed your voice nor hand nor face to express. You moved, and I traveled with you, Matt, actualizing, not fantasizing, using sound. And it was so interesting, Lucien, when you used the term jarring, when it came to the vo um the piece I wrote is called Blank, and I'm going to read it very quickly about uh, what I saw that adds to the YouTube piece and what I saw today. It's called Blank. Vroom, I am hyped. Vroom, I am ready for speed. Vroom, I compete with actions, words, and reality. My reality vrooms like my dreams, my actions my motions, my seat, my helmet that withstands the buffeting from well-meaning and the meanies. I am not allowed to drive over. I don't need to catch up on life. I am living my life. And you sit, you sit, and watch me fly by, eat my dust. Vroom. So if you get a chance, watch Matt as he drag races. It's another aspect of, of Matt Cummings. Okay, thank you. Diane, thank you so much for that. I, I You know, Matt and I have been friends for a while. I did not know he did drag racing. So now I have to look at the video. <laughs> now you have to go mess with him. I was like, huh? <laughs> oh, funny. And I want to apologize to Lucian because I thought he had put the hallelujah music, not realizing that it was my YouTube videos that had gone on and on. <laughs> so. Yes, Diane, we especially curated our argument for you. <laughs> um, Ian, I think you were up next. <laughs> Thank you, right. Diane. I wasn't sure what the thing was, so I've, I've got one here that I wrote um, late last year in November. It's based on an article I read. There's a, there's a natural phenomenon called Brocken Spectre, where if you're walking on the mountains and covered in cloud cover and mist, sometimes if there's somebody maybe two or three miles away walking uh, and the sun is behind them, it projects an image onto the mist of the cloud cover in front of you like a screen, and you can sense or feel that you're walking alongside somebody. It looks like a spectre or a ghost. It's a real person. It's, not, it's just it's just kind of a funny lighting effect. So I did a series of four short <clears throat> poems based on it under the heading apparitions. It may have sort of vague relevance. So one, the ghostly hovers hanging in the low cloud, needle points of cold mountain tops wrapped in damp mist, the broken spectre of a distant fellow traveller, we walk together side by side, oblivious each to the other's existence. And two, rocks looming glary from out of the clingy damp cloud cover, the world seems just a blurred mirage from this perspective as walking the tops, putting just one foot in front of the other. Third, <clears throat> number three. My mother, when she wanted to reprimand me, she wouldn't scold me in the normal sense of scolding. She'd quote Robbie Burns at me, more of a scalding than a scolding, it would seem. So scalding is a form of uh, Norse, uh, poetics, you know, a scout, I think it was a uh, Norse uh, term for uh, sort of like a court poet. And four, finally, 
Faces appear out of the dull fog of internet dreams. Some unfamiliar strand of false memory syndrome or a broken circuit in the wired up interstices of the winding sheets of time. But now as the days grow shorter, dimmer, they are beginning to fade, sinking into the dulled background of the ether. Thank you, Ian. Three little tigers, three little tigers, they run fast, they run fast. One tiger has no eyes, one tiger has no ears. It's so strange, it's so strange. I was a tiger. I was a tiger with no eyes. Little tigers should not see some things and yet she saw. I was a tiger with no ears. Little tigers should not hear some things and yet she heard. What about the third little tiger? She's the one who could not speak, gagged without a voice, hiding in shadow invisible. Today I found out the official version only had two tigers. I'm the third non-existent. That's a wonderful twist there. Remarkable. Loved it. Thank you. Kamlin and the third imagery strikes so hard. You know, beyond the borders, the non-existent tiger is there. It's there, it very much exists but nobody recognizes its presence. The margin of invisibility divorces its absence, though the absence is pregnant with presence. When I read this poem, when uh, you sent it to me, it, I sat and thought over it. The third tiger, it connotes so much. Very, very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malvi. Thank you, poets, for considering the work that Matt Cummings and I curated for you today. For those of you uh, who would like to revisit the content again, this would be on uh, Club Mermaid and uh, on Poetic Spit's uh, YouTube channel. We'll have that video coming soon. Um, thank you, Lucian, for editing our poems and our shows for us. And it's good to have you back with us, Lucian. Each one of you, thank you so much for uh, bringing your voices. Always moving. Thank you for your camaraderie. Next week, we have Diane Murray Ward as our Sayang artist. Sayang once again uh, means love in uh, Malay. And uh, we'll have a prompt from, uh, from Diane this week. And then uh, we will be writing to that prompt and Diane will be uh, sharing her love for your poems. All right, we are lovable, we are capable, we are valuable, we are able. Until next week, see you between the lines. <laughs> <laughs>